Welcome to Parenting Decoded, a podcast for practical approaches to parenting. I'm Mary Eschen. I think that it's good to empower parents with knowledge and tools to help navigate challenging issues. I've had podcast guests on anxiety and educational testing so far, and I really felt that this being Mental Health Month, that a dive into substance use and abuse would be really helpful. In this podcast, my guest is Richard Capriola, who has over two decades of experience working as a mental health and addictions counselor. Richard has a new book that was just released called The Addicted Child, A Parent's Guide to Adolescent Substance Abuse. I found it really useful in learning about the different substances and what signs to look for in determining addiction and where to turn to if you need help. Leave me a review and let me know what you think. I'll put a link to the book in the podcast notes. And I do just want to say, I apologize for my laughing at the start of the interview. We had just done 20 minutes of recording when I figured out that I had forgotten to press the record button. So silly of me. So that's me. You'll hear laughing at at my mistake. Richard was so gracious and didn't miss a beat. All this podcasting certainly stretches my brain. So thanks for being forgiving of any glitches. If you have questions, please contact me, mary at parentingdecoded.com. Enjoy this podcast interview in the meantime. Welcome, Richard Capriola, to my podcast. I am so happy to have you on board today to talk about addictions and your new book, The Addicted Child. And wanting you to introduce yourself and what led you to being able to uh, write the book. Thank you, Mary. It's a pleasure to be here. And and thank you so much for inviting me to the program to talk about this issue of adolescent substance abuse. Uh, I I came to write this book after having worked for over a decade at Menninger Clinic, where I was hired to be an addictions counselor for adolescents and adults. Menninger is based in Houston, Texas. It's a large psychiatric hospital. Um, And during my tenure there, I worked with a number of adolescents and family members members. Uh, My responsibility was to do addictions assessment and treatment. And often I would sit across from parents and I would go through their child's history of using a substance and give them the diagnosis of a substance use disorder. And they would look at me and they would say, I had no idea this was going on. Or if they did suspect their child was using a substance, they would say, well, I sort of suspected something was going on, but I had no idea it was this bad. So when I left Menninger, I retired a little over a year ago. I set about to write this book, which I wanted to be a roadmap. I wanted it to be a concise book that in a very short period of time, because it only runs a little over 100 pages, would give parents the basic information so that they would be more knowledgeable about adolescent substance abuse, less fearful of adolescent substance abuse, and know what to do in the event that they're confronted with this issue. So the book has a number of chapters on it that are very short, but are packed with a lot of information that I hope parents will read and feel comfortable that now they've got this, now they feel a little bit better better about it. They know what to look for. They know what the warning signs are. And if it develops in their child, they know what to do and where to turn for help. Mm -hmm. And I easily downloaded it. It was a very reasonably priced. And I found that it is less than 100 pages. And I read it in a couple of hours. And I what I really liked about the format of the book is that it's based on topic. So, you know, whether it's marijuana, alcohol, inhalants, whatever, but each one you, you give statistics about how likely these different things are um, in our, our teens lives um, and what to look for. And I just thought it was really, uh, I like the format a lot. And you give some ideas about what to do if you find yourself as a parent in those situations where you think you're suspecting your child is um, needing some assistance. I would love for you to talk a little bit about a couple of the areas that I think um, I'm based out of Silicon Valley in California. And the things that I saw mostly with my boys and the the teens that were in my life um, were there was a, definitely vaping going on, definitely marijuana and alcohol. And can you comment on those and um, just sort of the prevalence in what that you see from an addiction specialist standpoint and what we as parents might be looking for uh, yeah. if we suspected things and 
maybe explain vaping too. <laughs> okay. Well, alcohol and marijuana seem to remain the two most popular substances that uh, teens are attracted to. I think they're still attracted to alcohol and they're still attracted to marijuana. There is some abuse of, of over-the-counter drugs or some abuse of prescription drugs, uh, but those tend to be less than 5% of, say, seniors in high school. Uh, what we have noticed, though, in the last three years is a tremendous surge in what is known as vaping, which is to take a substance like nicotine or, or marijuana and use an instrument that turns it into a vapor, which is then inhaled into the lung. Um, an example of, of, of the increase that we're seeing is that uh, about three, three years ago, the number of high school center, the percentage of high school seniors that were vaping uh, marijuana was 9%. Today, it's closer to 22%. Um, the number of high school seniors that were uh, vaping nicotine was around 18% three years ago. It's now closer to 34%. So Whoa. there has been a tremendous tremendous increase in this, what we call vaping of primarily uh, marijuana and, and nicotine. And there was a study done not too long ago at the University of Rochester Medical Center that looked at vaping that both adults and adolescents were doing. So this, this study included adults who were vaping. And it reported that uh, adolescents and adults who were vaping were reporting that they were having difficulty in concentrating and remembering, in concentrating and remembering. Hmm. And it seemed that those students, those adolescents who started vaping between the ages of 8 and 13 were more likely to report difficulty in concentrating and remembering than those students who reported vaping starting at age 14 or over. So the earlier they started, the more likely they will report that they were having difficulty with concentrating and, and remembering. So this vaping issue is becoming a major issue among the adolescent population. Parents need to be aware of that. Well, and um, this is that whole jewel controversy too, that got so much press over the last few years about the flavors and how they're fun and they're easy to hide and all that kind of stuff. What a, What's your comment on that? That's very true. Uh, Juul is one of the uh, products that's marketed out there. It's a uh, it's an instrument that 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 people use to turn the substance into a vapor. Uh, some of these devices uh, look like USB drives, which means it's very easy for kids to disguise them. Teachers may not recognize them. Parents often will not recognize them. So they're easily disguised and easily used, and they're readily available. Uh, and I think that's sort of what is surging uh, the increase in the vaping that we're seeing among the adolescent population. Mm -hmm. So if if a kid is using something, and I'll just cut, cut, say it a dual just because that's such a popular uh, brand, is it, do they use it once and it's done? Or is it something that's rechargeable? How, how does that work? Well, there's a chemical that's uh, that, that's used within the instrument itself. The instrument has a, like a little atomizer in it. And basically, it heats the substance up regardless of whether it's marijuana or it's nicotine or it's a fruit flavor. Uh, the, the, the instrument is designed to heat it up and turn it into a vapor, which is then inhaled. So, so is it the battery operated? Is it? It, Do you it's charge got a, it? <laughs> it's, it's got a little uh, atomizer in it. it. It's an electronic device, and it's it's reusable. Uh, so you can you can change the flavors. You can you can change different uh, amounts and uh, of nicotine and and different. Uh, so there's like little marijuana. cartridges that they put in. It's like a little. It can be like a little cartridge. Yeah. So the reason why I'm asking is that if I, as a parent, saw these little things around. Like not, not having vaped myself, I don't really know what they look like. I can imagine what a pen looks like or a USB stick. But if the refills are also something I should be looking for, like what do they look like? I guess I, I, guess I should go pull it up on Google and, and see. Yeah, I, and that's what I would exactly what I would recommend parents do. You know, Google, um, you know, inhalants, in, uh, inhalant uh, instruments, uh, or or, or, or just uh, just uh, Google Jewel, J U U L, and it'll show you the different versions of it. It'll give you a mm -hmm. description of it. Uh, it may even give you a link where you can buy the product. Mm -hmm. So, how about um, 
comments on uh, all of that and the teen brain. What impact? The, the thing what, that parents is it a big deal. The, 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 what I would like parents to understand, and it's important enough that I devoted an entire chapter in my book to the neuroscience of addiction, is that the adolescent brain is in the process of maturing and developing. Our brains don't get fully mature until around age 24 or 25. So the adolescent brain is in the process of developing and maturing. Um, and it's very important that we protect protect our brains, um, introducing a substance, uh, whether it's um, a marijuana or any other type of illicit uh, drug, uh, has the potential to do some real damage to the brain. So the message to parents is your child's brain is in the process of maturing and developing. It's forming those integral connections that are so important to things like abstract reasoning, higher order thinking, motivation, uh, learning. And it's important that that brain be protected from 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 you know what damage can be done by these substances because they the the regardless of the substance they all eventually hit the brain mm -hmm. yeah especially in other podcasts i've talked about that brain um the brain development and how the teen brain half the neurons slough off and are, need to be reconnected and if drugs are are breaking the bear you know breaking those development cycles like it could be really damaging even yes. but it's long-term damaging like the kids don't say like oh mom it's it's fine it's just a little alcohol or marijuana or vaping or whatever and it's like we really need to be vigilant vigilant about our stance without you know i guess my encouragement to parents would be to have discussions about these things and to bring up information without sounding like a lecture though that's the i think that's the real tricky point for parents to be able to have good enough communication as your child is growing, especially as they come into the teen years and tween, tween years and teen years, um, that you can have discussions about the impacts of this stuff on, on it their is. brains. It it's, is. And, and what I found was 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 most helpful in, in working with teenagers was the neuroscience approach. Uh, they, they really weren't interested in hearing about these drugs being illegal uh, they, or, or that if they continue to use, their grades are going to drop. They might not graduate. They might not get into college. They might not get a job. They didn't care about any of that because they didn't believe it. But what they did pick up on and what they were interested in knowing was the neuroscience. They hmm. wanted to know how these substances work in the brain and how the how the brain can be changed by these drugs that they were interested in mm -hmm. so if what i encourage parents to do is uh, learn about learn a little bit about the basics of neuroscience uh, because you can use that as as an opening to a discussion that you can have with your child about how the brain works the importance of protecting the brain and perhaps what some of these drugs do when they interact with the brain mm -hmm. the child may be very interested in that Huh. Well, that's good to know that, especially you having worked with kids who are really, truly addicted, um, that they they like that angle, that science angle, instead of a parent lecture angle about illegal stuff and all that. How, what should a parent be looking for? What are the warning signs that they might, that their child might be addicted? addicted to something as opposed to, you know, your kid tries alcohol or something like that. I mean, I think a lot of us ha as children ourselves or ha have children um, have had teens, they know that their kids try it and trying something completely different than being becoming abu abusive with that substance. Yeah. What, what should I be looking for? Well, warning signs is such an important issue that I have them throughout my book. Um, uh, you know, there's warning signs for a child that might be using alcohol. There's warning signs for a child that might be using marijuana. There's warning signs for a child that might be developing an eating disorder or self-harming themselves because many times an eating disorder and, and self-injury uh, can, can accompany a child who's using a substance. Not in every case, but 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 I have seen some of those cases. Um, you know, the, the warning signs are important because so many times I would sit across from a parent and, and after they learned all of this information, they, 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 they felt guilty. You know, how did I miss the warning signs? What went wrong? What kind of a parent am I? How did I not know this was going on? And 
the reason is because nobody ever told them what the warning signs were. Nobody ever helped them to see what they should be looking for. So I put a lot of emphasis on the warning signs in my book. Um, and as a general rule, um, what I advise parents to do is pay attention to the changes that they see in their child. Uh, you know your child better than anyone. So pay attention to those changes. Don't assume that the changes that you're seeing are just a result of normal normal adolescent acting out. They, they may very well be normal a adolescent acting out, but they may also be an indication that there's something else going on underneath the surface that you need to look into. Uh, some examples would be a child who was earning very good grades and now the grades are starting to decline. A child who used to enjoy participating in sports no longer wants to participate in sports. Uh, a child who used to be very social and outgoing now becomes very isolated and quiet. Uh, um, a child who very freely introduced you to their friends, you knew who their friends were, you knew who their families were, now becomes very secretive about who their friends are. So these are just some examples of some of changes that parents need to pay attention to. Now, the other thing is you want to you want to pay attention to how extensive these changes are you know if you see a change it lasts a day or two there might be some realistic reason why that's going on uh, but if these changes tend to uh, last for a while they go on for days or weeks um, and the number of changes that you see increases then i think you should be more concerned that that perhaps you need to dig into this a little further mm -hmm. and if you do suspect, what, what's the next step to, to take? Well, the first step is to have a discussion with your child, uh, to, to, to express your concern, to uh, not, not, not to interrogate the child, not to accuse the child, but just to express your concern and see if your child will offer you any information. That's a discussion that's likely to go one of two ways. It's either going to blow up and the child's going to become angry and, and defensive and argumentative, uh, <laughs> or the child might actually reveal some information that you weren't aware of. But regardless of how that discussion goes, if, if you suspect that your child is using a substance, um, you need to move to the next step, which is to get some comprehensive assessments done so that you can get some professional uh, information, some professional advice, and you can get uh, some answers as to uh, how extensive this is and what the next steps should be. And what kind of assessments and stuff would that, what, what would that look like? Well, my book identifies assessments like an addictions assessment, which is what I was doing, where you will get information on the number of drugs that you're using, how, how extensive the use is and when it began. Um, you'll also get a diagnosis as to whether or not, the, we call it a substance use disorder now, whether it's in the mild, moderate, or severe category. Um, so you need to get that addictions assessment done, which will give you information on the substances used by your child and the diagnosis. You also need a uh, psychological or a neuropsychological assessment. And the reason for that is to see if there are any of these underlying issues that might be prompting your child's use of a substance. So you want to look at the psychological effects, if there are any. Uh, many of the kids that, that, that I worked with who were smoking marijuana would tell me that they were doing so because it helped with uh, anxiety. So it could, it, if it's there, it could be any number of psychological issues that your child might be turning to a substance to medicate. And you, you, you want to know if that's the case, or you want to know if it's ruled out and, and it's not the case. And a, and a psychological or a neuropsychological assessment will give you that information. Um, so those are two examples of the assessments that, uh, that, that you want to get done as a parent. And would you get those recommendations from your child's pediatrician or local? Yes, you can. Yeah, I would probably begin with my uh, uh, my family physician, the pediatrician. Uh, many of those are uh, will have references and recommendations and referrals as to who you can turn to to get some of these specific assessments done. You can talk to the school counselor. Many times the counselor or the social worker in the school will have resources and referrals that they can make to you. You might contact the uh, local mental health association, the NAMI, the National Institute. Uh, they can also 
also make referrals to you. And they can also be a source of support for the parent. You know, parents need to have support as they go through this too. Uh, sometimes we focus just on the child, but you as a parent need support too. And, and you may need some, some, uh, some help as you go through this journey with your child. Maybe it's a good friend, maybe it's another family member, maybe it's a counselor, but uh, you, you may very well need to have some support and some encouragement as you go through this journey with your child. Mm -hmm. I remember reading the book um, called A Beautiful Boy, and it was made into a movie with Steve Carell a couple of years ago. And it's about a journey of a father with his addicted son. And uh, what a what a amazing journey. I mean, r bumpy ride. Um, how bumpy yeah. can it get for that ride if you're trying to work with an addicted child? What what alternatives? I mean, going to counseling um, is the mild form, but like how what other how how in depth could the uh, journey take you? Well, every child is different, and every situation is different. There is no one treatment that that fits for everybody, and that's why we get to the importance of the comprehensive assessment. The comprehensive assessment is so important because it not only gives you the diagnoses that you need, and maybe it's a diagnosis of just substance abuse disorder, but is it mild, moderate, or severe? It also will give you, if it's appropriate, uh, the diagnosis for any underlying uh, psychological or mental health issues that need to be treated. That then forms the basis for what's called a treatment plan, basically the recommendations to you on what comes next. Um, and, and depending on the severity of all those diagnoses, you may look at a full range of treatment. Some kids will do very good and very well and successfully with outpatient treatment, where they see somebody maybe once a week or twice a week. Other kids might need what's called intensive outpatient, where they go several times a week. And then for some kids where the underlying issues or the substance abuse is, is so severe, they may be looking at a residential type of treatment where they're in a residential setting for, uh, for a period of sometimes months that can go up to uh, six months or longer. Um, the thing to remember is that for a child who has both a substance abuse issue and a mental health issue, say anxiety or depression or trauma, um, that child will need to go to a, to a center that specializes in that underlying issue um, uh, because they will also treat the substance abuse. So many times we get focused on treating the substance abuse that we neglect treating the underlying issue. And unfortunately, if that's the case, uh, the, the child is, is very likely to relapse because we haven't addressed the underlying issue that needs treatment. Right. And I know that the, the families that I've worked with over the years, the addictions that I've seen and worked with, a lot of them had to do with anxiety. Silicon Valley has lots of kids who are anxiety prone because our, there's so much pressure on them to perform and perform well. And it, it was that, oh, I'm just trying to relax, just trying to chill. And, um, and once the anxiety was lessened, the kids came around. And they were able to not no in no serious treatments were needed, you know, no residential or anything like that. But you're so right in observing that there's underlying causes oftentimes. Sometimes it's peer pressure, right? I think Jewel, a lot of the things with vaping, it's like, oh, it's so trendy, as opposed to it might it might relax some kids, but I get the impression that it's more trendy as opposed to marijuana. The kids that I know that have abused it over the years are more like it, it releases my anxiety. Um, uh, anxiety is a big one. It, it was in uh, an awful lot of the cases where I worked with kids that were smoking marijuana. Uh, you know, they would tell me it helps with the anxiety. Yeah. Um, and, 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 it, and it may have, but what they didn't realize is that it, it, it has a boomerang effect. It makes the anxiety worse over time. Yeah. But there's different routes to substance use. Kids get involved in different routes in different ways. Some of it is through peer pressure. Some of it is to fit in and there's no underlying
underlying mental health issue involved. They just want to fit in. They want to yeah. be part of their peer group. They want to join in. They don't want to be excluded. And that opens the door for them, you know, say, uh, vaping marijuana or drinking alcohol. And then there's another class uh, where there is an underlying issue and, uh, and they have learned maybe through peers um, that a substance helps to medicate that underlying issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the questions that um, we had talked about was, how has the pandemic impacted all of this, addictions and mental health for adolescents? And the pandemic has disrupted adults, it's disrupted families, and it's disrupted children. Uh, and I think that it is having an effect that we are just now beginning to scratch the surface of in regards to the mental health of adolescents and, and probably adults as well. Um, this, the Centers for Disease Control, for example, has noted that since this pandemic began over a year ago, there has been more than a 20% increase in the number of emergency room visits by grade school children. It's over 20%. And there's also been an increase in the number of teenagers who have urgently had, in, been in need of mental health care. So I think we're just scratching the surface on the mental health ramifications that this pandemic has caused for children and, and for adults as well. And I think the next episode of this will be when children transition back into the traditional classroom setting. This will be a very difficult transition for a lot of kids who have been confined to home. Uh, and for those who have a lot of anxiety or a lot of nervousness, it could be a real challenging time for them to reintegrate into that social environment. And parents just need to be sensitive of that, to recognize that that is a possibility, that this transition to school may go very smoothly for a lot of kids, but it may be a little bit more of a bumpy road for some other kids. Kids and for parents to understand that and, and to talk to their kids about how they're feeling about reintegrating back into the school um, and see if they can have a real discussion with their children about how it's going. Yeah, well, and just for those parents, for us parents to be aware that all that extra anxiety of reentering school might lead to experimenting with drugs to help some relieve some of that anxiety, too. It could. Um, do you have any comments about addictions and boys versus girls, teen boys versus teen girls? Yes. Is one easier, um, harder? You know. Well, I think what we what we see is um, when it comes to alcohol, boys are more likely to binge drink than girls. Binge drinking is you know drinking in an awful lot of alcohol in a short period of time and. You know, binge drinking is uh, is something that goes on through high school and into college, uh, but it tends to be something we see more in the boys than we do the girls. It's not to say girls don't drink because they do, but boys will tend to binge drink at higher rates, I think, than girls. Uh, boys are also at a little bit higher risk of abusing over-the-counter drugs than girls, um, and boys are more likely to become uh, to abuse multiple substances. Girls may tend to focus on one substance, say marijuana uh, or alcohol. Boys are perhaps more likely to venture into experimenting with more than one. They may concentrate on one, but they may experiment or try out uh, multiple substances. We also uh, see that boys, um, when we talk about underlying issues, mental health issues, we see conduct disorders, behavioral disorders, and learning disorders among the boy population. Um, we see it with girls too, but, but uh, more, more often with boys. When it comes to girls, we tend to see anxiety, depression, and sometimes uh, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so those are some of the differences, but every child's different. Every, every situation is different. Um, and, and, and those can also be generalizations. So we need so to be careful with that. Is it easier for boys to get addicted than girls or girls than boys? Any, or is it all, anybody could get addicted at there's no, any, they're any, equal. <laughs> they're, they're equal. Anybody is subject to be being addicted. And that brings up a very good issue that, that no child is totally protected. 
from exposure to substances. No child is totally protected. Mm -hmm. There may be protective environments, but no child is totally protected. It doesn't matter whether you live in an urban area, a suburban area. It doesn't matter how much money your family makes or what church you go to. And it doesn't matter what school you go to. And it doesn't matter how well that school does with uh, academically. Every child is, is vulnerable to being captured by these substances. Mm -hmm. And because these substances are readily available, there's two things that I think that are that are propelling what we're seeing with adolescent substance abuse. And one of them is the availability of drugs and these drugs being widely available to kids and the harmfulness that kids perceive because they don't see these drugs as being very harmful. So when you combine the fact that they're readily available and these kids don't think that they're very harmful, that's a perfect environment for the substance abuse. Yeah, especially as when we as parents sometimes get caught off guard with the vaping, you know, epidemic that's going on. Like, we didn't grow up vaping, so what do we know about it? We just hear it. <laughs> and so we yeah. blow it up in our minds and, and don't even know how to approach it. At least that's how I feel. I don't know if other parents feel the same way, but I get the impression that we feel a little overwhelmed by that. The other thing that I wanted to touch on briefly is sometimes little littler kids like let's say fourth fifth grade early tweens and teen early teens they start experimenting when they're really young with household products and i wanted you to comment on what kind of household products might they be how do we um just keep an eye on it uh just so that parents are are aware of something that to us seems so innocuous that could be so harmful to our kids Yes, that, that's an important topic, and I have an entire chapter devoted to what we call inhalants, uh, which is basically substances that are inhaled. Uh, many of these substances are found in household products that we have around our houses. They're cleaning solutions. They're, um, you know, paint thinner or paints, or they might be glue sticks, or they might be uh, markers. Um, they're in various household products that we have around our houses. They all have a, uh, a vapor to them that a kid can inhale. And the thing with inhalants, uh, I, think, I think most parents might be familiar with nitrous oxide, the so-called laughing gas that, 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 uh, that, that is also classified as an inhalant. But what they have in common is that they will give a person a very rapid high, a sense of feeling high, but it doesn't last very long. And the danger with that is because it doesn't last very long, a child will use it repeatedly over and over and over in a very short period of time, mm -hmm. uh, which can be very toxic to the brain. And we tend to see these inhalants at very young ages, preteen age. Years, uh, which makes it even more toxic because their brain is is less developed than, uh, say, a, a teenager who's 16, 17, or 18 years old. Um, so we tend to see it in very young kids. My suggestion to parents is that if you have any of these. Uh, substances around the house, or even if you have prescription or over-the-counter substances, drugs, uh, or you have alcohol and you have kids, teenagers or preteens in your house, you need to make sure that those are all secure away from access to your kid. So if it's an inhalant, a household product, um, things you have in the garage, things you have uh, in baseboards and things like that, if you have any prescription, over-the-counter drugs, any alcohol, please Please, you need to secure that because kids will get access to them. Yeah, I just remember growing up and hearing about kids sniffing glue. It's like, oh. yeah. I mean, it's just such an odd thing to me, but it's so innocent. Like people have glue around their house. You know, people have paint thinner around their house. You know, it's like actually a lot of paints are latex based nowadays if you're painting rooms in your house. But all of those things, like nail polish remover, I think was on your list, yeah. or nail polish. And yeah. it's like, those are things that are just around our house. And I guess the thing, like, would it be something that I would look out for that, like, all of a sudden there's lots of nail polish in the house? <laughs> or like, you know, like, uh, you know, it's like, if you'd notice a, a change in the amount of paint or paint thinners or, you know, like, just be aware, like you said, be aware of how much alcohol you have in the house whether you keep yeah. it locked up or not. Um, I know oh, yeah. that 
that when I was a kid, it was always possible to, oh, um, I shouldn't say, put water in the vodka or whatever so that you could drink some <laughs> and all that. I mean, but those are things that, that, you know, if you did something as a kid, you should not be excluding that same thing from your kid doing it to you. No, I once had a young man that, uh, that, <laughs> that was in the hospital that I was treating, and that's exactly what he would do. He would go to the, uh, to the uh, liquor cabinet, which was not secure, and he would look for vodka or gin because it's a clear liquid. He would, he would take a portion of it, and then he would replace it with water. And it took a long time for his parents to catch on that he was raiding the, the liquor cabinet that way. And with prescription drugs, you know, parents don't count the number of pills that are in those bottles. Models. So a child will get in, and they may take just a few. Um, so you you need to you need to just be vigilant. Is yeah, what I'm saying. I know that like people abuse things like hydrocodone or Vicodin, things that you got given. We adults might have been given prescriptions because we had surgery or something, you know, broken ankle or something like that. And we're just we just leave them lying around. We don't yeah. even think it's like, oh, yeah, there's just some in the cabinet. We don't think about it. But all of a sudden, like you said, we don't count the pills. It's like, oh, there were 20 and now there's 18 or 16 <laughs> or whatever. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's, you know, the overall feeling that I get from reading your book is to be informed. To be informed, uh, knowledge is and, power. Yeah, aware. Um, aware. To be, be, and be vigilant. Yeah, be vigilant, be aware. Don't become paranoid over yeah. this issue. Don't become afraid of it, but just be knowledgeable. Know what to look for. If you are in the situation where you suspect your child is using a substance, know what to do. Know what resources are out there. And if you, your child needs treatment, know what the treatment options are. Just help. Help. I think it helps parents feel a little bit more secure that after reading this book, they say, okay, I've got this. I've got this. I, I, I think I think I know this a little bit better than before. Yeah, I think that's so helpful. And in my podcast notes, I will put a link to your book. And again, for parents, it's called The Addicted Child, A Parent's Guide to Adolescent Substance Abuse. I really appreciate the time that you've given us today. And I hope that um, parents will take the time to get such a wonderful, valuable resource. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate your contribution contribution to the discussion and you're taking the time to, to talk to me about this important issue for, for parents. Thank you very much. 